Welcome to Stonewall. I'm Robert, the executive director here, and here is our author, Alyssa Max Goodman. Yes, that's me. <laughs> a native Floridian who now does not live in Florida. <laughs> because the book Glitter and Concrete is about the um, drag New York community. And it goes back to the 1800s all the way pretty much to the present, uh, looking at what drag means and how it has influenced so many other things, mm -hmm. which some of which I had no idea that it actually influenced <laughs> until reading the book. What's amazing about the book is it's definitely, uh, well, obviously it's nonfiction, but it's a serious book on a very interesting topic that is a serious topic, and you understand that even when you read the prologue, that this is someone who takes this very seriously and has taken it seriously since they were a young child when they were first exposed to drag almost quite innocently as not something that was a big deal, but uh, something. <laughs> and then you see the interlay of all these different things in terms of how people in the drag world uh, influence other aspects of society. And it's fascinating, and certainly we'll let Alyssa talk about it. This is the first in a series of three interviews. The other two will be on Zoom of women authors, which is a prelude to March, which is Women's History Month, when we will have more women programming. But this is also a response to that the last three interviews were male authors. So we will go back and forth, trying as we do to have parity and equity and equality between the genders and all the other different aspects of the community. So, welcome. Thank you for coming. Oh, it's absolutely my you, pleasure. Thank you got you to miss me. terrible weather. Oh, love it. <laughs> so, how bad can that be? When are you going back? We're supposed to go back tomorrow, but we'll see. You yeah, will see. <laughs> Many people's flights have been canceled over and over and over again, but time will tell. Knock on wood, as they say. What? <laughs> before you read some. Yes. What for you, after you were a child and understanding that this was a subculture, sure. what was it that kept you so interested? I think as I moved throughout my life, I learned more and more about drag in different <clears throat> ways. Um, when I was a child, uh, I came to it when I was about seven the film Tu Wong Fu, Thanks for Everything, Julie Newmar. Oh, uh, when I was a child, I, I came to it when I was seven, um, uh, after seeing Tu Wong Fu, Thanks for Everything, Julie Newmar, and I, I tried to devour it every way that I could, um, and a lot of the time at that time, um, that was through film. So, The Birdcage, Priscilla, Paris is Burning, um, and then as I got older, there were more and more things to see. So I think when I was maybe in high school, there was Connie and Carla. Um, but when I got to college, um, I learned about Judith Butler <laughs> and to understand the nature of gender performance and then to understand the inherent rebelliousness of drag um, just added layers uh, to my love of it. Um, and it is and has been this driving artistic force, like this, this art form that has in many ways defined the course of my life um, and taught me so much about what it means to exist in a body, yeah. And what's interesting is many of the people that you reference in the book, mm -hmm. even going back to the, eight, the late 1800s, mm -hmm. it was political. Mm -hmm. It was a very political statement. Yeah. And as you point out with your two characters who are from the 1880s, 1890s, mm -hmm. uh, they were very aware of the freedoms mm -hmm. that they were able to access because they dressed as men. Yeah, yeah. And they were allowed to access them um, because they were dressed as men. 
you know, it wasn't because, uh, you know, well, you're respected as a, as a, as an actress or anything like that. Um, it was because it was just like, well, you're dressed like us, so it's fine, which is just such a wild, uh, thing to think about happening in the 19th century. Um, yeah. <laughs> and it also pointed out in the book just how repressed <clears throat> women were. Sure, yeah. What I also think is interesting about the people that I write about is that um, the inherent relationship between, I'm going to say inherent, the relationship between uh, women was viewed so differently, um, where, uh, you know, one of the people I write about is, a, is an artist named Ella Wessner, who was uh, a person at the time we would call a male impersonator. And Ella Wessner like skipped town on some dates she had booked to go to Paris with her female lover. Um, and the only negative press she got was about her skipping town to miss her performances, <laughs> not to be with this woman. And I think, you know, the, the way that that's interpreted, it could be one of two ways of like, you know, oh, we don't care about that part. But I think what the other part was is that like, I just don't think that, I think it's very possible that at that time there were more people in mainstream culture who just didn't see women as having a, <laughs> a relationship um, in that way. Um, so it's, it's one of two things, but um, yeah, I mean, that's one example of, <coughs> of that inaction, yeah. <laughs> and then obviously it changes significantly when you go from male impersonators to female impersonators, mm -hmm. and then there's a huge difference between transvestites and drag performers. Um, well, what's interesting is that the language used to describe um, all of these different people was at one point all under the same umbrella. Right. So um, a drag queen was at one time um, a person who was a transgender woman a person who did drag, um, you know, on Halloween or on New Year's. Uh, it was a designation of amateurishness. Um, uh, and, oh, I lost the other one. Where was it? Um, it was a designation. Crossdresser, maybe? Yes, thank you. And it was a person who was a crossdresser, um, a person we would now call a crossdresser. Um, so all of these categories were grouped together, and there's an interesting example of that which is in the 1970s there was a magazine called drag but it was run right. by a person it was run by two people one person was a person um at that time called a transvestite that we would now call a crossdresser and the other person who ran it was um a person who did drag um at balls or through lee, lee brewster um who did drag at balls and um that was uh, his sort of primary example, primary way to be interested in presenting in drag. Um, so uh, that's, you know, that's one example of it, living in all these different categories. And as time goes on, um, it, it changes and, you know, the more specific designations <coughs> emerge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Out of all the transitions that take place, mm -hmm. leading all the way to the enormous success of RuPaul, sure. which is, I think, still shocks a lot of people that yeah. it's such a popular show, mm -hmm. and global, yeah. even in places that one might not expect, Yes. what is the biggest transition that you think <clears throat> from studying this that has taken place? Like why, what caused this show? Not necessarily, no, no, no. Out of all of the things, mm -hmm. including the success, mm -hmm. what is the biggest transition between the 1800s or even before mm -hmm. to where we are today? What is, as, as new words mm -hmm. came out, as we started to think of trans people versus mm -hmm. transvestites, which are completely different. Right. All of those things, what is for you in the research that you've done the biggest single transition? I think a very important transition was drag being accepted by the queer community. Because for many, 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 many years it wasn't. Um, and that was something that started to change around the 90s uh, with RuPaul. 
And one of the reasons that happened was because RuPaul became, um, as drag has been for thousands of years, um, uh, but as drag has been, let's talk about, you know, defining that time period a little more throughout the last hundred and, you know, the course of the book, 160 years, drag in many ways has been the representation of queer life. Um, and I think once that was represented in culture in a pos in a way that could be seen as positive by a large group of the queer community, it was more accepted, but I, that's also not universal. Um, but I think one of the things that started to happen was that, um, and this in the book, it coincides also with um, the relation, the changing uh, relationship to nightlife in New York. So when Giuliani came in, as I'm sure you know, you know he he cracked down on a lot of these venues that you know there couldn't be dancing, there couldn't be all these like very minute sorts of things, and um, people needed a way to get people into the bars, and that reason became drag. Um, and I have one of the queens in the book talking about that, where like you know you need how. <coughs> Well, you couldn't have dancing, like you needed some form of entertainment in the gay bar. And um, the more ubiquitous it came, there came with it more acceptance. And with more acceptance, there became more standing up for it and the more incorporating it into, into you know, different aspects of, of culture that people were creating. Um, and then the other really important part is that um, drag at this moment um, and the queer community in general in this moment has more allies now than it's ever had. Absolutely. Who are standing up for queer rights and equality and representation. Um, and with that uh, comes more possibilities for representation across queer life. Um, and drag, of course, is one of them. Um, so I think it's it's a couple of it's I you know one of the things I believe is that nothing happens in a vacuum, you know. Um, so I think it's it's several different historical aspects in conversation with each other, um, leading us to this moment. And aside from RuPaul, who would you say is another seminal figure in the movement now? Ooh. Well. I think what's interesting is that RuPaul has created opportunities for other drag artists uh, with the show. Um, <coughs> and what is interesting and exciting is that these drag artists have then gone on to create uh, their own spheres of influence that are also quite large. Um, and so I think the people who come from that show um, the people who are most successful, I believe, who come from that show are people who do more than just drag. Um, and that's not in terms of you know entrepreneurship, although it certainly can be, but um, even ideologically, you know, um, I think a lot of people who come from that show, um, not a lot of, but I think there are select people who come from that show who have consciously used their platform to uh, have and be have to be acknowledged themselves as artists and to then incorporate other people into their work so those people can also be seen as artists of the same caliber and they are um so i think there are people from the show who are making great strides doing that but i think that the the people who are local artists who are working in their communities and continuing to give space for drag and lots of different kinds of drag are and have always been the foundation of, of what we're looking at here. Um, because those are people who were, who were making this work and who were doing this work long before some, you, you know, RuPaul's Drag Race ever existed. But, um, and I think those are people to, to look to as well and to, to remember when we are considering where drag is now and what it is now. Um, I mean, we don't have Sasha Valor without the Pyramid Club, you know, and we don't have Trixie Mattel without Lady Bunny, <laughs> you know, things like that. Um, and not just because these spaces 
uh, bred these people, but because you know these were these were living embodiments of um, success in the form and what it could look like, you know. Um, so uh, that is that is. Uh, <laughs> well, it, it was interesting because recently there was an article about you may think that RuPaul is the most popular mm -hmm. drag person, mm -hmm. but. There's a drag queen from Brazil sure. mm -hmm. that has like third, right? Yeah, who has yeah. like thirty times more mm -hmm. followers on thirty thousand or thirty million uh, more a followers than yeah. than RuPaul has on Instagram. Yeah. Well, what I think is interesting too about that is that there are other countries that have uh, a very different relationship to drag than the, than the U.S. You know, like um, it is a long acknowledged and beloved part of. Uh, British culture. Drag is a long, you know, through the panto uh, well, experience, you know, exactly. So this is, you know, um, there are there are countries that have a lot, a very different relationship to drag than the U.S. Um, Which has a contentious relationship, yeah. <laughs> especially really here in Florida. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. very much. So why don't you read something? Oh, sure. Um, well, uh, Since you've got things marked. I do have things marked. Um, how much time do I have? I, I, my selections amount to about 20 minutes, but I can pick and choose. Do 15 minutes. 15. Ooh, well, now I don't have to read from the beginning because we talked about that. So we will we'll go, and you can stop me whenever you want. I will. <laughs> can you speak up just a little oh, bit? Oh, sure. Uh, <coughs> is this better? Yes? Okay. <laughs> you must come over, Bert Savoy purred, reducing his audience to a heaving pile of laughter. As a female impersonator, Savoy was never without enormous feathers towering out of a hat atop a garish wig. His high camp stylings edged in fringe or pearls alongside Jay Brennan, the straight man in the comedic sense, as he and Savoy were also lovers, made them the toast of any town they visited. Where Julian Eltinge's demure characters diverted audiences' attention from sex altogether, Bert Savoy's sexuality drew them in, whether they knew it or not. Savoy had begun his life as Everett McKenzie in Boston, but by the time he was a teenager, he claimed, he worked as both a pooch dancer, what we might call a go-go dancer today, and a taxi dancer, a person people paid to be their dance partner. However, in a streetcar chugging along the New York City streets, he'd soon meet a chorus boy named Jay Brennan. As a team, Savoy and Brennan realized quickly how successful their jokes were, as did the Schuberts, who cast them in the passing show of 1915, which was an equivalent of Is It Killed Follies. Shortly after, Savoy and Brennan appeared in a string of Broadway shows, but in 1920, full-fledged stardom arrived with the second iteration of the Greenwich Village Follies. By that time, <coughs> Savoy and Brennan's act was fully formed. Savoy would be in full drag, that bold red wig atop his head with towering hat, drenched in jewels, not to mention a cigarette holder and, a brightly, co and brightly colored and oft written about garters. He found his inspiration in a woman at Rector's, an upscale restaurant on Broadway filled with people trying to be seen. This particular woman, quote, waved her fat hands all covered in diamonds and dished the dirt, he said. Savoy was a wild, uproarious parody, bursting with luscious quips in a high-pitched, flamboyant voice up from his usual baritone, while Brennan, his suit and tie smart, offered a more sedate delivery. For example, a 1921 recording called You Must Come Over, distributed by Vocalion Records of the a Aeolian Piano Company shares, Brennan, would you like to go for an automobile ride? Savoy, no, I'm just walking home from one. The act was also peppered with Savoy's catchphrases that later in infiltrated the larger culture. His, you don't know the half of it, dearie. I'm glad you asked me, an aforementioned you must come over were the you're a virgin who can't drive or I'm not a regular mom, I'm a cool mom of their time, even making an appearance in the song The Half of It Deary Blues from George and Ira Gershwin's 1924 musical Lady Be Good, also starring the young sibling dance duo Fred and Adele Astaire. It's rumored that the legendary actress Mae West, no stranger to Greenwich Village and known for her slinky scintillating repartee, was actually <coughs> inspired by Savoy's performances. Her famous catchphrase, why don't you come up sometime and see me, 
was not far from, you must come over, after all. Because of Savoy's high camp on stage and off, he's often considered among the first real drag queens, as we know the phrase now. Greenwich Village Follies director John Murray Anderson wrote that, quote, a greater comedian and female impersonator never strutted the stage. Out of costume, Anderson writes, Savoy was, quote, bald, paunchy, middle-aged, and blind in one eye, but on the stage he was a revelation. After an hour in his dressing room when he had been made up, trussed into a corset by Agnes, his perspiring maid, adjusted his flaming wig and put on his form-fitting dress and spreading feathered hat, he emerged a dashing, if slightly bawdy, fashion plate. The moment he stepped on stage, he held the audience in the palm of his hand. Savoy was a sensation and appeared in Vanity Fair, Variety, and countless other publications. Savoy was among the few female impersonators known to be gay in his time. His mannerisms were blatantly campy off stage, and he referred to himself and his friends as she or her. It was behavior he could get away with and keep his career intact, Lawrence Senelik writes in the changing room sex dragon theater, because it served as a signal to others, especially straight men, that he wasn't a threat. Tragically, Savoy died in a freak accident in June 1923 at the peak of his career. A thunderstorm swept in when Savoy and friends were walking on Long Beach, Long Island. Famously, Savoy, Savoy was said to have quipped, Mercy, ain't Miss God cutting up something awful? Just before lightning struck a key suspended on his wet bathing suit, killing him instantly. Oh, wow. oh, oh, oh gee. <coughs> his death made national news, and the New York Times described him in their obituary, obituary as, quote, incontestably one of the greatest comedians the American stage has ever known. Jay Brennan attempted to relaunch his career with a new partner, but <coughs> Savoy's satiny, pointy-toed heels were far too big to fill. Nonetheless, Savoy had created a model that would be an inspiration for many performers to come. It's significant that the peak of Savoy's fame arrived during Prohibition. Many Americans were already disillusioned with the government and the reform societies that claimed to protect them. In New York, a broader wave of wartime conservatism and created an energetic backlash. Though the decade and into the 1930s, through, oh dear, throughout the decade and into the 1930s, drag and other forms of queer performance were embraced at clubs and speakeasies run by organized crime syndicates, but its popularity wouldn't last forever. All right. Oh, thank you. Um, so now we're going to jump ahead about 20 years. Come on in. 30 years. Ooh. I have a quick question. Yes, of course. Um, you said popularity would not last. Was there a backlash or was there it just? There was. Um, so what happened was that in uh, around the time of the Great Well, let's go back. OK. Um, so with the, uh, during Prohibition, there developed an, uh, a phenomenon, we'll say, called the pansy okay. craze, which was a desire for, um, to, to, uh, to see and interact with queer performance. And that, uh, that had two aspects to it. The first was what was called pansy performance, which was um, a sort of, uh, I'm thinking, of, you can see an example of this actually on screen in Victor Victoria, where Robert Preston is oh. sort of like tongue lashing the audience wearing a tuxedo. Um, that, is, that was something that was beloved at this time during the pansy craze. And then these pansy <coughs> performers, as they were known, would often perform alongside drag queens. And uh, that was the first time in mainstream straight cultural memory where drag was associated specifically with queerness. And when the Great Depression hit, the, there was a backlash against the pansy performance and also the drag artists because this more conservative mindset took over. Um, and so the way that drag had to live pretty much until Stonewall was um, underground. And it was in venues run by the mafia. It was a lot of the time for straight audience audiences. Um, and because of this backlash, that was where, when I was talking about before, the relationship to the queer community's relationship to drag was also like, get those, we, that's not us, that's not who we are. You know, get those people away from us. What if my, but, so, yes. but that transition <coughs> mm -hmm. out of the 20s into the depression mm -hmm. was a universal change, yeah. not just that. I mean, it that's was right. everything changed. Yes. 
Yeah. Uh, the 20s was definitely more progressive, yeah. more free, mm -hmm. sort of like the 60s. Yeah, there became a taste for the taboo. And once uh, the Great Depression hit and, and the taboo was removed, you know, um, uh, everything kind of went back underground and this conservative mindset took over again. Um, so that was... Women, <coughs> women stopped bobbing their hair, dresses sure. got long again. Mm -hmm. oh, interesting. Yeah. Right, so it was a combination of, of many things and certainly economics played a, a major role in that as it always does. Mm -hmm. And you can look at the correlations between the 1920s and the 1930s mm -hmm. and many other times in US and world history where the economies and the change of the economy from something that was robust and energetic and people were getting rich mm -hmm. to where people were pulling back. Right. And obviously drag mm -hmm. would get beaten to death right. well, uh, because it was a real symbol of that other lifestyle. Sure, and one of the things I write about in the book is that backlashes against drag have been happening you know, since the dawn of time. Um, but one of the reasons that happens is because men in power feel threatened. And it doesn't necessarily, like you said, have only to do with drag, right. but it becomes one of the... Easy pieces to go after. And sort of like umbrella topics that get thrown under the bus at times like these. Well, because you go after the low-hanging fruit, and that's an if obvious thing. But it's... It, <laughs> yes, <laughs> as if you will. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's interesting because in ancient Greece, ancient Rome, mm -hmm. Uh, Shakespeare's day, boys played women's roles, mm -hmm. but boys were not threatening, and women could not be seen in public okay. in that kind of way. Well, that that experience also dates to the time of the samurai, you know. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. To the dawn of kabuki, and kabuki was originally performed by uh, female sex workers, and mm. these performers got so popular they became more popular than the samurai. And the government couldn't have that, so they said, well, women can't perform these roles anymore, it'll only be men. Mm -hmm. And then the men were performing all of the roles. Um, but there is, uh, there is a troupe in Japan called Takarazuka, which has been around since I think the 1920s, um, and all the roles are played by women, and a lot of the roles are, are male roles. Yeah. So, yes. I, I think it's kind of is it understandable about that backlash when you mm -hmm. consider that the, the, the 20s were considered the roaring 20s. Sure. And it was a time of decadence yep. and mixing of the races in, in mm -hmm. all these bars, particularly mm -hmm. during Prohibition. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, that was, and that was literally blamed for the, for the Great Depression. So th in reaction to that, you know, they, they came down hard on anything that might be considered decadent, immoral, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so on. So, uh, but it, it became it, all it, part of that decadence and, and that free yes. spiritedness that was blamed for for, for, for the depression. Sure. And for you also consumers. saw it with disco. Mm -hmm. Disco was a decadent time when races mixed and the gay community and the straight community mixed mm -hmm. and people went to places and could hang out together, which they could not do in good company. And from the 70s, we went into another spiral um, which closed those things down and of course AIDS. Mm -hmm. So that made it so that it was the curse of that behavior that God was punishing people because they danced. Sure. And so <laughs> okay. go ahead. All right. So we will we'll move forward about 20 or 30 years. Separate social spheres emerged in New York's nightlife in the 1940s and 1950s. Uptown meant money, power, breeding, class, chic, high society, John, John Straussbell wrote in his phenomenal history, The Village. Downtown was hip, arty, scruffy, bohemian. Clubs specializing in gender impersonation were mostly located in what we now call the East and West Villages. Given all of this, the successful 1945 opening of Stephen Kranz and Anna Genovese's Club 80, 181, a gender impersonation club in New York's downtown, might have seemed groundbreaking. But the fact that it was backed by the mafia didn't hurt. Like the other mob-run Greenwich Village venues that preceded it, straight couples on safari at Club 181 made the majority of its audience. 
Located at 181 2nd Avenue in the East Village, the 181 boasted a luxurious spiral staircase that descended to the theater. The walls were painted blue and white and a plush red carpet lay underfoot. Venues like Club 181 often avoided explicit description of what one might encounter in the evening's floor shows. An advertisement for the club in the May 21st, 1946 edition of the New York Daily News, for example, mentions nothing at all about the performance content, simply stating that there's, quote, never a dull moment, and it's, quote, smart to be seen at Club 181. <laughs> the language in the latter statement harkens back to the <coughs> pansy craze when gender impersonation was sought out by straight audiences seeking sophistication. Gender impersonation thrived at the 181 with butch queer women in sparkling tuxedos and their male counterparts in glamorous gowns. Female impersonators, or female illusionists, as they were known at the time, also <coughs> stripped, sang, danced, and told body jokes. Drag queen was considered either an epithet, a derisive slang for a transgender woman, or a designation of amateurishness. Welcome to the 181, the MC would offer, where boy meets girl and no one knows the difference. The club thrived, making over $500,000 annually, and this is in the 1940s. It was illegal and forbidden, historian Lisa Davis said, and people lined up all around the corner and paid big money to see it. The mafia, the Genovese family in particular, certainly liked that and kept the clubs like these in their repertoire for years. The Lux venue drew stylish celebrities like Elizabeth Taylor, who, as legend would have it, visited one night with Debbie Reynolds, Eddie Fisher, and then-husband Mike Todd. Talent was allowed to mingle with the audience, and the performer Titanic, who's actually also in there, if you'd like to take a look, nearly seven feet tall when wearing heels, with perfectly arching brows and lushly drawn-on lips, waltzed drunkenly over to the famed Miss Taylor and asked the actress in her throaty voice if it, if it was indeed her. Fuck no, Taylor replied. I'm Natalie Wood. <laughs> um, there's more about that section, but I can move on, I think. Um, all right. Well, it's interesting because um, <laughs> not about L Elizabeth Taylor, but what, what's fascinating is as the straight world adopted drag as their form of preferred entertainment mm -hmm. for the who's who and the in the no crowd, mm -hmm. it became less and less liked by the gay community. Sure. Mm -hmm. So that divide I always found very interesting. Well, what's, what's uh, important and interesting about that too is that um, the phenomenal drag historian Joe E. Jeffries, on whose shoulders we all stand, um, did interviews with a lot of these people who worked at these venues and uh, one of, in one of the interviews I remember, which I also quote in here, um, there was a waiter who was a butch woman who was talking about you know, what it was like to be working at these spaces. And she was just like, well, you, if you went to a gay bar, you wanted to go and mingle, and you couldn't do that at these places. This was a place where there was a white tablecloth, there was steak and lobster, there was, you know, um, and then you know, some of the men uh, would purchase other services um, as well, which was how some of the girls made their money. Um, but uh, it was not a place that you could go mingle, you know, which is how you, how you would meet someone, you know, as, as much as you could in spaces like that at that time. Yeah, so that's absolutely part of it. Mm -hmm. Like you would go and see it once, but you wouldn't like go back regularly the way you might mm -hmm. go to like, I don't know, to, um, to Alibi to see a regular drag show or something like that, you know. But they didn't have regular drag shows back Unless then. they were here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but then it was for a straight, it was really for yeah. a straight audience. Yeah, it was very much billed as a novelty. Yeah. Um, all right, so now we're going to jump ahead another 20 or 30 years. God, we're aging very <laughs> <laughs> Well, I wanted, I wanted to give like a Maybe we want to go backwards. <laughs> 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 How many of you have seen Le Ballet Trocadero de Monte Carlo before? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's what I want to read about. Okay. U.S. Ballet Soars, said the cover of Time Magazine in 1978. Performers of all stripes in New York recognized this appetite for dance, and some sought to, to make the most of it. Larry Ray performed with the Coquettes on point in the classic Dying Swan solo from Swan Lake. His alter ego, Ekaterina Sobechanskaya, also appeared in an intermission of Charles Ludlam's play The Grand Tarot and in Jackie Curtis's Vain Victory. 
Shortly after, in 1972, the drag ballet troupe Trocadero Gloxinia Ballet Company was born. A most unusual concept at the time, and even still today, Trocadero Gloxinia continued to perform until 1992. The credo of Lowry was, it wasn't about technical excellence, it's about effort, and it's not about camping, said John Kelly, who performed with the company. It's about aiming to achieve honesty, and in that there will be both poetry and, of course, hilarity. For some members of Gloxinia, this wasn't enough. In 1974, Peter Anasto, Snatch Taylor, and Anthony Basai, all trained dancers, started Le Ballet Trocadero de Monte Carlo, with more of an emphasis on ballet. They hired trained dancers, only a few of whom who, do, who had ever done drag. That August, the Trocs, this, as they've become known, made their debut at the West Side Discussion Group Center, a queer community, the West Side, Dis oh dear, the West Side Discussion Group Center, whee, a, a, a queer community center at 9th Avenue and 14th Street. The parody company we've need, the parody company we've been needing may have just arrived, wrote the New Yorker's dance critic Arlene Croce. Its debut could not have been more of a success. Anastos, Taylor, and Basai were able to access their own Greenwich Village queer community while bringing Uptown's Lincoln Center crowd to downtown spaces, even ones that were decidedly gritty. They used drag to transcend boundaries between highbrow and lowbrow, queer and straight, in a, in a notoriously conservative art form. Anastos laughed that at first, quote, the point work was really terrible, but the ideas translated. People wanted to see us because we were funny, and we used history, we used ballet as a tool for laughter, he continued. We did it with a lot of love and a lot of knowledge, and I think that got people interested in us. Again, I don't think an, a guy in a tutu is very funny. You gotta do something with it, and do something they did. For the 1975-1976 season, they participated in the National Endowment for the Arts touring program, growing into a full-fledged ballet company. A ballet mistress taught daily classes with rehearsals in a loft on West 24th Street that Taylor and Basai had crafted into a dance studio. It had a wooden floor that Anastos called Splinter City with a chuckle. Mm. There were tours, appearances on Broadway, a photo shoot in Vogue, write-ups in the New York Times, and television appearances with the likes of Dick Cavett, Shirley MacLaine, and more. Shirley MacLaine danced with them on the show. Mm. Their success only continued. In 2023, Le Ballet Trocadero de Monte Carlo celebrated its 49th anniversary. Mm. And this year, it'll be 50. And they were just here. Oh, they were? Oh, oh fabulous. Yeah. What's it oh, called? Le Ballet Trocadero de Monte mm. Carlo, and Trocadero is spelled with a K, T-R-O-C-K, and they're called the Trocs for short. Um, and they do, a, they do a lot of events around the holidays. Is it that's what they were here? No, they, they were, were just, I believe they were just here. Oh, okay. <coughs> fabulous. They're great see them when they come through. But they did really improve their dancing over time. <laughs> There's a great documentary about, about them called Rebels on Point, um, where you can see you know, a lot of the, the background that these dancers have. And it is, it is fully from Hoyt, and is fully from the ballet world. Um, and then they add some eyelashes. Because yeah. I mean, they were dancers, yeah. but they had never <coughs> done Point. And when they started doing it, they did not do, as you said, mm -hmm. they did not do point well. <laughs> but as they worked mm -hmm. and as they took their own classes, yeah. um, they got really quite good. And the comedy became much more practiced and intentional than Just accidental. Right. Yes, exactly. How are we doing on time? You're fine. OK. Another 20 years later. <laughs> There were many models who gave superstar turns in drag, some long before RuPaul. Jay Alexander used to go out to Studio 54 in drag. He'd take first the BX-13 bus, then the 6 train down from his grandmother's Bronx apartment, then hop into a cab at 59th Street. I wanted to look beautiful and glamorous like a couture model, he wrote in his 2009 autobiography, Follow the Model, but he didn't want to be a drag queen. Miss J, as he became known, booked a Jean-Paul Gaultier runway show in 1984 and afterward was signed to elite model management in Japan with a $20,000 contract. He was 16 and modeled in drag on runways for years before becoming a runway coach for top-tier designers and the women who, many due to his tutelage, became supermodels. Later on, he also became known as a beloved runway coach and judge on America's Next Top Model. 
Connie Fleming began transitioning in the late 1980s and around that time walked the runway effect category at the House of Fields Grand Street Ball. There, photographer Stephen Mizell saw her and hired her for an Azadina Lyle book. She'd later appear on the runways of Tara Mugler, Vivian Westwood, and more in Paris and New York. Me being on Mugler's runway, that should have been the end of his business, Fleming told Interview in 2020. People thought no one would ever buy from him anymore, but his business did not go up in smoke. By the time the drag craze hit the runway, Fleming had already left drag behind, but she was grouped in with drag performers despite identifying as trans. It was the look of the moment, she said, but like International Crisis taught me, the punches are going to come hard and fast and you're going to have to be able to withstand. She was still booked and busy, a stunning force on the runway. But as the trend for drag on the runway faded, Fleming found her demand as a model also decreased. Around 1995, she said it was time to leave. The pendulum had swung, she said. Whether being put into the drag box or being trans, it was swept up into one pile and pushed out. Returning to New York, however, she found a new career in runway production and coaching as a tough door person at clubs in the city and as an artist. She continued print modeling for Mugler, Interview, Australian Vogue, <coughs> Candy, and more, always legendary. Billy Beyond, while working in management at the Pyramid Club, modeled for designer Todd Oldham in the early 1990s. He had started modeling in the late 1980s when David LaChapelle photographed him in women's clothes for a spread in Interview. Everybody saw it, and that was it. Who's the new model? And I started getting other modeling jobs in drag, Beyond said. Once you're in it, you can't take it off. Sorry, I'm sorry, you're not allowed. And beyond that, you will always be a drag queen. Always, whether you like it or not, he said. Todd Oldham loved the precision of Billy's look, and he said, and thought he had a great walk. When you're doing a show or casting anything or taking a photograph, it's all just about what and who can deliver in these moments. How is the best way to create this? So there was never really like, let's put a man on the runway in clothing. That never ever crossed my mind, Oldham said. There was just something about him, especially in that moment, and sort of looking back and looking forward all at the same time. He just really seemed to kind of capture it all for me and made me and made what we made look so much better, like he could really sell it, so to speak. Beginning in 1990, Billy appeared on 11 Todd Oldham runways, one of the hottest tickets in the fashion industry, alongside supermodels like Linda Evangelista, Cindy Crawford, Carla Bruni, Naomi Campbell, and Christy Turlington. While he was known as the drag model, like Fleming, he was really just a good model. That's all he wanted to be, but not wanting to be pigeonholed and hoping to expand his creative pursuits beyond stop modeling in 1997. In the mid-1980s, Zaldi, a Filipino-American fashion designer, entered the Miss Boy Bar competition at Perfidia's behest and promptly won. But he relinquished his crown and didn't get in drag again for several more years. Artist Matthew Anderson, later his partner of 10 years, began photographing and putting him in makeup. Suzanne Barch convinced Matthew, a six foot two white Australian, and Zaldi, a five foot nine Asian man, to appear at her parties as twins, <laughs> an idea Zaldi finds hilarious even now. They rethought drag for themselves, skipping chess pieces, accentuating small waists and padded hips, envisioning an edgy alien fashion drag, Zaldi says. Nightlife also led Zaldi to meet RuPaul, who he encountered for the first time at Club La Palace de Beauté in the late 1980s. Zaldi and Matthew soon became the performer's de facto costume and makeup team. They appear in RuPaul's 1993 supermodel video, Doing This. In 1995, after turns on the runways of Paris, Zaldi starred in a commercial for Levi's. He, he's a shapely figure in jeans, long dark hair, and red lips who gets into the back of a taxi cab, much to the delight of the driver. Shortly after, Zaldi takes out an electric razor and begins shaving his beard. I couldn't grow facial hair back then, and so they had to clip my hair and glue, glue hair to my chin so I had something to shave, he laughed. At, at his destination, Zaldi gets out and walks into a cloud of smoke coming out from under a New York bridge, and the words, cut for men since 1850, appear on the screen. The commercial was promptly banned in the U.S. <laughs> I'm an American. I was born in America, and you're saying this is too much for you, Zaldi said. Give me a break. It's Levi's. Levi's is from America. Not long after, Zaldi reimagined his design career, which was always his first love. He has maintained a regular working relationship with RuPaul for some 30 years. He designs all the performers' costumes, and also designed for the likes of Lady Gaga, Britney Spears, Michael Jackson, and countless others in that time. The issue of Zaldi and Levi's is an interesting one as it relates to the placement of drag in American culture. 
While there was so much discussion at the time of a drag boom in and out of New York, it was still considered fringe. Drag was by no means a respected art form, even amongst the gay community in New York. Zaldi remembers in the late 1980s, there were still bars that didn't allow drag queens at all. There was a stigma to saying, I'm gonna become a drag queen, he said. It's like, ah, oh, nothing else is going for you? You wanna focus on a career? It wasn't a career choice. Now, it's a career choice. I have a quick question. Um, yeah. The ballroom scene, mm -hmm. what's the interplay, impact, vice sure. versa on did you explore that in your book? Yes, it's okay. definitely. I mean, you can't write a book about drag without the ballroom scene. Okay. <laughs> so could you talk about what, you know, the impact of vice versa? Sure, the what the impact of drag is in ballroom or well, ball, just the ballroom in, interplay in the of the two. Oh, you sure. You started talking about runway and all that type of stuff, yeah. Absolutely. So um, the, the ballroom scene as we know it now actually stems from the 19th century. Um, and at this time, drag balls began in Harlem, and they were these lavishly attended events. Um, and the ballroom culture that we have now sort of began to take shape in the 1940s with um, a drag artist and event producer named Phil Black, who was originally from Pittsburgh. And um, Phil threw balls called uh, Fun Makers Ball, and he did it for almost 20 years. Um, and around the 1960s, um, there are regular drag pageants happening. And there are, uh, one brand of them is thrown across the country by a person named Lala Sabrina. And uh, her company is called the Nationals Academy. And one of these events is called the Miss All-America Camp Pageant. And this is the subject of the 1968 documentary, The Queen. The Queen, right. Yeah. Um, so one of the, uh, one of the, Candidates? Or, uh, contestants. There we go. One of the contestants in this film is a drag artist named Crystal Lavasia. Yeah. And um, if you've seen this film, uh, it is actually, <laughs> it's very slow. Um, but this extremely dynamic moment happens at the end where Crystal Lavasia is very upset at her placement in the competition. And um, what ends up happening uh, in the time after this film is that uh, what we know as the modern ball culture begins to emerge. Um, and it emerges when her friend Lottie says to her like, hey, like, why don't you put your name on a house and then we'll throw an event. And it was so successful that this house of Lavasia spawned several other houses and is now this international phenomenon. Um, and it got and what's interesting about ballroom um, in the same, you know, this sort of same relationship that drag had uh, to the queer community, ballroom had a similar one um, in, within its own community. Um, and uh, the, the documentarian Felix Rodriguez um, was in the House of Milan and he joined the House of Milan after seeing Paris is Burning. Um, and he was just like, you didn't, balls were so looked down upon before this documentary and no one wanted any part of it. Um, but after seeing the documentary, so many people came into this space, um, even though it was, it, was, it was bustling before that, um, but so many people came into the space and they stopped allowing video cameras. Um, but it continued to snowball and the influence of ballroom within fashion is undeniable, within music is undeniable. Photography. Photography, dance, like it's it's, uh, it's its own force of nature in the way the drag is its own <coughs> force of nature. And not all ballroom is drag. Um, uh, it's sort of like a quadrilateral situation. There's a lot of ballroom that is there are some drag categories, there are runway categories, there are dance categories, and there are beauty categories. Um, uh, and it, it runs the, the, I mean, now it runs across the, the international spectrum and there are, you know, there are houses in the Netherlands and there are houses in Ireland <laughs> and there's also, you know, um, but it was, it started as a place for young queer people of color to have have space for themselves um, 
and especially in uh, these uptown areas of New York, like it was not a place where you could necessarily be safe and out. Um, into the 1970s, one of the people I spoke to. And after that. And after, absolutely. Um, As we saw in Pose. Sure. Um, uh, sure. One of the people I spoke to is an artist named Luna Luis Ortiz, and Luna, um, Luna found space for himself in these, uh, in these communities, especially after he had been diagnosed with HIV at 14, um, and um, he remembered one of the things I talked about to him about for the book was he remembered um, the episode of All in the Family where um, one of Edith's friends who is a drag artist is murdered um, and everyone was laughing about it. And he was like, and that was the culture that I was growing up in. And so when I went downtown to the Hedrick Martin Institute and I saw all these wonderful people who were, um, who were expressing themselves and they were dancing and they were being openly queer, it was, it was a revolution. <coughs> you know, he describes it as um, Dorothy encountering Oz for the first time. <laughs> um, and it became, it became a safe haven, it became a, a you know, this um, gorgeous space for uh, creativity and safety and beauty. And, you know, now uh, Beyonce has drawn from this culture to create her new album, you know? Um, Which is written about in this magazine right back here. Oh, fantastic. Um, mm. And so I wish that it got more credit for a lot of the changes that it has instituted, um, but I'm glad that it is getting more than it has ever had, certainly with Pose and Legendary on HBO Max. And I mean, Beyonce, talking about these influences is huge and very important. I mean, like, when she, <laughs> one of the people I wrote about in the book before this, before Beyonce's album came out was the drag artist Moi Renee, um, who wrote or who performed this song, Miss Honey, and then I heard it on Beyonce's album and I was just like, this is historic, you know? This person was, was known for this song, but it's, for whatever reason, became kind of like a, a blip on the radar of culture. And there were so many people who influenced um, what became known as bitch tracks, right? Well, just uh, yeah. a, a caveat. Oh. This room over here, this exhibition space, has been donate, dedicated to marginalized communities within the LGBTQ community. Mm -hmm. And the first exhibit in there was a gentleman by the name of Bo McCall, who's a New York mm -hmm. black artist, mm -hmm. who's from Philadelphia, mm -hmm. who Ma Renee, Mm -hmm. was one of his best friends. And so <laughs> in the tape that we had there, that song was played like every 15 minutes because it was on a loop. <laughs> and he would talk about all of his 10 friends, yeah. all of whom are dead now. Yeah. But Bo survived. And so he feels as an artist, he has an obligation to tell their stories and keep them alive. Yeah. And that was one of the stories that That's he fantastic. works to keep alive. Yeah. So. It's so interesting how all of these things intersect. Yeah. And um, that's my only exposure to Ma <laughs> Renee, but hearing that song, yeah. Miss Honey, yeah. day in and day out for months, because that show was up for three months. Yeah. Uh, I know that song. That's fantastic. Would I'm very like glad to, to hear that. Um, I couldn't do that voice if I tried. But these songs, these bitch tracks, stem from ballroom. Um, because they were the songs that you could, you know. <coughs> and uh, so to then have, to <laughs> finish writing the section and then to have Beyonce's album come out, I was just like, ah! <laughs> it is a historic moment to have these artists who, who have not, you know, historically gotten the credit they deserve to begin to get it in larger ways. Yeah. Yes. Uh, your book, uh, by the way, you're going through with the uh, excerpts, mm -hmm. seems to be chronologic, starting from correct. the 1800s. Yes, 1865. Mm -hmm. 1865, Civil War time, <laughs> to after, after all the way to uh, present day. Yep. And when the movie is made of your book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Who do you want to play? Do you plan, <laughs> do you plan to uh, 
Well, if it happens, I mean, do you see uh, a need for a movie that documents the, the uh, uh, you know, drag and so forth all the way start historically? Because th I think the movies that are out now treat it present day or present day at the mm -hmm. time the movie was made mm -hmm. and do not go way back into the beginnings. True. Um, so my dream for the book is to have it be a multi-part documentary series. Um, in the way that the Pride uh, series was, or in the way that um, the, uh, the there was a hip hop documentary on Netflix, like a multi part, where like every um, every episode can be one or two decades, something like that. that um, so I would love for it to live as a, as a nonfiction work. Um, someone approached me about wanting to do it as a work of fiction, and I just I was just like I would like for people to know who these people are first mm -hmm. before their stories get fictionalized. Although you came into this from a fictional movie. Yeah, that but was, I didn't think mm, they were real. That, <laughs> right, exactly. That's the point. But yeah. it was also interesting because yeah. those were big name art actors yeah. doing something that was really uncharacteristic at the mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. and they got away with it. Yeah. I don't know how big a movie it was, but it was certainly not unsuccessful. Um, Patrick Swayze and John Leguizamo were both nominated for Golden Globes. Mm. Oh. Yeah, from that movie. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we know the story <coughs> about Golden Globes back then. Well. Is that the one with Wesley Snipes? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. yeah. I have a question. This, perhaps this is more an issue of, of semantics than, than anything else, but mm -hmm. you know, when you look at a movie, uh, uh, a series like Pose, it, it's the transgender community that has the balls. Yeah, when I think of drag, this is how I th and perhaps you can correct me, I, I tend to think of men uh, who identify as men, mm -hmm. people who identify as men, then dressing as women, but doing it in this grand fashion and, and, what, and, and kind of, you know, is there a difference between the women who, who, who identify as women but who are biologically male at birth and the people who identify as males who, who are doing it as, as performance art? So drag is for everyone, is what I always say. And drag, anyone can do drag across the gender spectrum. Um, so, you know, there's there's an aspect of, of people who think that m me sitting up here dressed like this is drag. I am one of them, actually. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, bless my heart, I do not look like this when I'm watching Friends reruns on the couch, you know. Um, but uh, drag exists in, in so many different formats and performed by so many different kinds of people across the gender spectrum. There are people who are transgender men who perform in drag as men. There are people who are transgender women who perform in drag as men. There are people who are transgender women who perform in drag as women. There are people who perform, um, the the phrase that has uh, emerged is a, lovely, a lovingly use of the phrase drag thing, where you know a non-binary person performs mm -hmm. in drag as a non-binary person. You know, you, you think of Barry Humphreys and Dame Edna Everidge. Yeah, he was he was great. Is a category in yeah. and of itself. I mean, it's I still think. drag. You know. Yeah. Um, so it's what I think uh, happens is that it's a matter of intention. You know, um, is does this mm -hmm. person want okay. to call it drag? Mm -hmm. But sometimes you know, there's casual usage of the phrase where like, yeah, I have to you know get in drag and give a presentation tonight mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, but, you know, uh, if a person is not uh, making the commitment to saying that they are in drag, then that's just a person living their life. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's what I would okay. say. I, know, I think that's a good answer. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. Yeah. Um, I have one more, but oh. it's short. <laughs> it's, the, it's, it's the last one. <laughs> Or I can stop, whatever. No, no. <laughs> okay. The true community doesn't need a bar or a club or a department store to thrive. <coughs> On a Friday night in April, Wang Newton is having a party at their apartment where people I've seen across stages on stages across New York are out of drag for the night. Well, mostly. Emmy Great, Emmy Great nails are twinkling under purple and magenta lights as she sits comfortably on the couch and sweats. She is talking about her career in drag when a DJ told her she should learn the song This Is by Grace Jones. 
And before long, the song is on the speaker and Emmy is giving shows, the nails shining and the hands expressive while punctuating Miss Jones's lyrics, which are so crisply lip synced as if she was singing them herself. Emmy is powerful and captivating even in sweats, crawling like a jungled cat across Wang's wooden floors. It is magical to watch. The dynamic force of drag is in full effect, a power that runs so deep it's palpable even through fleece. Calling out tenacity, optimism, and dignity, the song also reflects a history of drag in the city, its performers creating light in the dark, relentless in their quests to be themselves on stage, especially in times when they couldn't do so offstage. In drag, they find a freedom of expression, a self-realization that isn't always possible out of it. They are true, manifested as creation. New York has been an incubator for generations of drag artists who made history with their glamour and drama, talent and wit, dedication and righteous rage. They were outlaws, designing lives in the underground to escape an unsafe and unwelcoming exterior. Whether in Bushwick or Hell's Kitchen, Jackson Heights or Harlem, drag in its essence is an act of anarchy and defiance, a flouting and parodying of gender norms. Drag is as much a leotard and a Beyonce megamix as it is a beard and a Kate Bush number. The choice, the variety, and the freedom are what give drag its power. Now drag is on national and international stages. It has long faced oppression, often in times when men in power feel threatened, but its resilience and spirit have toppled such forces decade after decade. In spite of ignorance and opposition, it is still embraced by so many like never before in ways that a young version of myself and so many others wouldn't have thought possible. The day before I write this, there was even a drag performance at Radio City Music Hall with the Rockettes. And while drag race is an industry juggernaut, that show couldn't exist without the generations of performers that preceded it. Drag did not de need to be on television to be the powerful art form that it is, that it always has been. What a time to be alive, when one can go out every single night in New York City and see drag. New performers arrive, excited to make their own mark on the city that has become, without question, a drag capital of the world. And while the fight for queer equality is far from over, there are more possibilities and more room to experiment with gender and performance than ever before. I'm excited to see how the next generation of performers continue to push the envelope in ways even their drag sisters couldn't have fathomed. In this city of millions of people charging ahead with the blood that makes and has always made New York move, Drag stops time for just a few minutes to remind us of the potential of our own creation, of the triumph of wit, imagination, and community over oppression, of glamour as a potent force of resistance. For generations, performers have harnessed the power of drag to tell their own stories, stories that should not be lost, stories that, even in a city laden with concrete, continue to glitter. But now you should go back and read the part <laughs> in the prelude that talks about the cement. Oh, <laughs> the short one mm -hmm. at the end? This is where the title of the book comes from. There's a certain way the light hits a New York City sidewalk, a streak of glitter in the daytime, a mystical shine in the darkness at night that seems to transcend time. Suddenly, when that glitter appears on the concrete, there's a jolt of memory. Every pair of heels that's twinkled across its gleaming surface, every tattered Oxford, every chunky combat boot, every life that's come before. We're taught to believe glitter, like drag, is artificial. But when light hits the concrete just the right way, and so clearly sends sparkles flying, there's nothing more real. Oh, I read that a, a couple of times. That's great. That's good writing. Thank you. Uh, you're a good writer. Thank you very much. Uh, that's, good that's why I said in the very beginning <laughs> that even though it's a book that's based on facts and based on history and all of that, it is a really good read. And you start to know these people. And I can understand you saying that you would like to see it as a documentary yeah. uh, because the characters, the people, really are special and the people that you specifically singled out mm -hmm. to talk about uh, really tell just amazing stories yeah I mean I I would love for people to to know who they are before they get fictionalized and and things that are not as you know not everything that's in a movie is is 100% fictionalized but I would love for 
for people to know the real versions of these people before lots of artistic licenses are taken, you know, which is, mm. you know, it's what happens. And dramatizes them versus exactly. leaving them real. Yes. Mm -hmm. So anybody here want to be a producer? <laughs> <laughs> well, I live in Hollywood. Oh, actually. fantastic. <laughs> My people will get with your people. <laughs> you know, I, sorry, I have no connection. No, that's okay. <laughs> yeah. You have Netflix Wendell. Yeah. You're right near that Netflix office. I live yeah. right near the Netflix office. <laughs> oh, but that's great. They would probably be the ones that would do it. You well, know. Have you had any feelers out? Do you have any feelers out? Um, n I would say not formally. I had, like I said, one one person reach out to me, but um, it was not quite what I was looking for. Yeah. Is and this I'm your not, first? Book? I'm not about to just give away the farm to the first person who asks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See what your options are. <laughs> You is know. this your first book? It is my first book. Uh -huh. um, it is Good start. not the first book I, I have contributed to other books. Um, and I'm also a photographer, so the photo I took is on the cover um, and then has been uh, jazzed by the art department. Um, but there's some more of my photos in the book as well. There's a section of, of mm. photographs, which you can't have a book about drag without photographs. Oh. <laughs> oh. Um, but I do have copies of the book for sale this evening if you're interested in purchasing one. Um, and then I'm also on social media at Miss Manhattan NY is my Instagram handle, and I think for everything else as well. Um, but yeah, if you have other questions about the book, I'm, I'm happy to answer them for you. Yes. Is it um, is there a kind of and maybe a regional differences in drag? You know, like throughout the United States, mm -hmm. like San Francisco, sure. and yeah. elsewhere. Um, because well, somebody I've seen perform, for example, is yeah. Taylor Mac. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, Taylor is very much, um, Taylor is a, uh, well, what's funny about Taylor is that um, when he was performing his work, or when Judy was performing Judy's work in Provincetown, um, there were people who were coming to see this work in the 90s um, and saying, oh, that's, that's so Charles Ludlam, that's so Theater of the Ridiculous and Ridiculous Theatrical Company and all these sorts of things. And Taylor was like, who's, what's that, you know? Um, and then began doing a lot of these performances, and one of them is one I talk about, in these queer bars in New York. Um, and now, you know, of course, it's, I think, a Pulitzer nominee, um, or a, a MacArthur Genius grantee, right. um, oh, and right. like all these, yeah. you know, um, uh, esteemed, spaces but comes very much from you know was doing one of these shows in in the space underneath uh, a queer bar in New York yeah. what about somebody like Ryan Landry out of Boston uh, I don't know Ryan's work okay. uh, yeah but I think um, there's what's interesting about drag is there are lots of different kinds of uh, let me go back what I usually talk about when I talk about sort of like the, the nature of different kinds of performance is that um, there used to be one kind um, and that largely had to do with the fact that it had to be presented as palatable to straight audiences and as soon as that wasn't something that was necessary anymore for drag to live there emerged all of these different genres um, genres that are more performance art based like Taylor's um, genres that are um, very influenced by the ball scene, um, genres that are influenced by fashion or by video games or by um, fine art or by, you know, and it just goes on and on and on. And um, those different kinds of drag live in all different kinds of cities. Um, and, you know, like I think, I don't know, for example, there's um, it, Atlanta sort of gets stereotyped as being like, oh, well, Girls are very pageanty in Atlanta, but RuPaul started in Atlanta as a punk, you know, um, and was doing this sort of what what he called like a gender fuck look um, in Atlanta at that time. And so, um, I think all all different cities have have all different kinds of genres of drag, and I, I don't know that I would say that one kind is localized. Uh, to one place or another because there's all different kinds of bars now too, right? Like you have queer punk bars um, and you have queer jazz bars and you have queer cocktail bars and there's all different kinds of performances at, at all of them. 
um, and also venues that are just that just specialize in queer performance in ways that uh, historically you didn't have. Yeah. In bigger cities, is it more professional? Because um, of the competition. What do you mean professional? Do you mean polished? Polished. I would say that in bigger cities you get a breadth of what people want to perform um, and the levels at which they want to perform it. Um, I think, so for example, in a place like New York, I mean, Jinx Monsoon was in Chicago, you know? Yeah. Um, and then there are these gorgeous little queer bars um, in in Brooklyn that, you know, people are starting drag for the first time. Um, and so there's there's a breadth of these different kinds of performances that happen. But there's a place for them to master their art. Sure, because I would that's say so. so. Because it's so yeah, big. Yeah, but I think, you know, I don't think that that's impossible to do in a small city either. I think maybe there's just fewer venues. Um, but, um, I mean, there are thriving drag scenes and, and... But thriving is still different than having the time to really get succinct in what you do because of the competition and uh, because of the opportunities. I think it, I think it depends on, on who you are and the kind of artist that you're looking to be, but I don't think that I would want to generalize about that because there's all different kinds of people who come from all different kinds of places Absolutely. who do who do all different kinds of work. <laughs> but a lot of them also move around. Sure, yeah. They How do you have. feel about the drag um, police and um, saying stuff about children being affected by viewing um, the, the drag? <laughs> well, police? look what happened to her after her life experience. Well, that's, that's you know. It's starting funny. with Wesley Snipes. That's what I say. I mean, I was seven years, seven or eight years old when I saw drag for the first time. And look at what it did. It filled me with so much joy. I wrote a book about it. I got pulled on stage by uh, Philip Wilson doing Geraldine in Las Vegas. Wow! And she was she was um, being threatened by killer <laughs> boyfriend at the time. I was a little nine year old. Yeah. And in the front row, and Philip Wilson pulled me on stage <laughs> and had me get behind this, and I was in. I want to say innocent little kid. <laughs> and um, supposedly I beat up Killer. Geraldine. And then got invited backstage as this little kid and Flip Wilson, you know, in all the regalia and yeah. all the, the drugs and alcohol and the dancers. <laughs> and so um, I don't know if it had any effect. <laughs> I, I am addicted to RuPaul's Drag Race, so I have seen every episode. I do yeah. know all the characters, mm -hmm. and it's an art form. Absolutely. But I notice our, our governor here in Florida says <laughs> that it's toxic for children to be exposed to art. Well, he's I toxic. Here in the <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah. How do you think that this... Um, this era that we live in mm -hmm. is going to affect the future of drag? Well, um, I think the thing that's heartening about having worked on a book like this is that all you see is the perseverance of the art form in spite of people telling drag artists that they shouldn't do it. And for, and this is, you know, this book covers 160 years, but this is something that has happened for centuries, you know? <coughs> um, sure. And uh, that is what I look to when I think of what's happening now, is that like anyone who comes along who, uh, actually there was the writer James Wolcott wrote a book, wrote an article about the book, and he referred to Ron DeSantis as, quote, a flop sweat presidential candidate. <laughs> um, and so, you know, there, there always comes along people who are like this, and they have throughout the course of history, and they are the people who disappear. And that's not something that I made up. That's it's in the book. That's those are then's the facts. You well, know? and I think that the other side of that coin is mm -hmm. that so much of what DeSantis has pushed has been pushed back. Yeah. The courts have pushed back. The public is pushing back. Yeah. And from someone who was was second to Trump, and a viable alternative is being talked about it after New Hampshire being out of the race. Yeah. So I think that that's exactly where it's going. And this is what I was talking about before, where like drag and queer community have more allies than they ever have, 
So there are people who are saying, no, that's, that's not the way it is, and, and working against someone like that and taking up space with their voices, you know, when they cast their ballots. Um, and there are more and more people who are unwilling to let something like this go. Um, and so that is something that I, I think about. And I've just, you know, and historically you look at it and you just say, oh, well, you know, we're right on time, unfortunately, <laughs> because these, these backlashes do tend to run in about 10 to 15 year cycles. Um, and soon they'll be done. Mm -hmm. This too shall pass. Absolutely. You know, if, he tr if history teaches us nothing else, um, you know, unfortunately, it also repeats itself. Um, yeah. But it'll also pass. Um, and it's annoying and cruel and uh, a, 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 um, a re rejection of, of rights that we have as citizens. And it's very difficult to look at. Um, and to hear and to, to have people who, whose livelihoods are impacted in this way. Um, but that is the heartening part, is that people are fighting back once in a while. But I think it's also important to recognize that when you have pushback, it's because of people fearing change. And they're pushing back because of the progress and the success that others are having. Sure, yeah, we talked about that. And yeah. that's really what we see here we see people who have lost clinging to something that no longer exists yep. and hoping that they are powerful enough to bring it back. When Push the toothpaste thing. back in that right. tube. <laughs> and it doesn't, it, happen. it doesn't go back. No, this is what we talked about, right? When men in power feel threatened. Right. And that's from the time of the samurai and before. Uh, way before. Yeah. Way before. Mm -hmm. And that's what we see. I mean, you know, this idea that we're going to make America great again. <laughs> I mean, it's such a stupid statement. Gay. Gay again. <laughs> but it, it's such a stupid statement. Because when you look at American history, in the totality, we're getting better as we go forward. And it's never been worse than it was yesterday. And it's never been better than it will be tomorrow. Sure. So the whole notion that they're trying to do something um, to protect, they're only trying to protect themselves in a place in history that never really existed. So we will go through bad times. Yeah. Uh, nobody knows how long the bad times will last. But the reality is, as Martin Luther King said, you know, we go towards progress. Paraphrasing, mm -hmm. but that's the reality. The arc of history. The arc, right? <laughs> yeah. And that's where we're going, and nothing is going to stop it because the river only goes in one direction. Yeah. So you may have beavers that create dams that hold things up for a little <laughs> while, but eventually it breaks through. 